bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Usheng Bagush, Monster Killer. Now then, last episode we had a fairly good run of things. We made progress in a whole bunch of different areas I've been meaning to touch on. We got to see some notable dwarves, got this lower fortress area cleaned up a little bit, and most importantly we got some decent progress done on these traps over here, namely these ballista. Two of them in this little ballista bank, which are going to be used to defend this hallway over here. And on top of that we also dug out a crocodile pit over here, at the other end of the entry hall. Nearly five levels deep now, but still incomplete. In fact, all of our defenses set up in this hallway are incomplete right now, which is a total shame, because yet again we find ourselves under siege by the frosty barbarity goblins. Oh boy, can we just catch a break for once? They were here not that long ago, but here they are again. Now, taking a look at this siege here, um, it looks kind of crappy at the moment. Not getting my hopes up too high though, just because more are going to flood in behind them. But it's looking like we have a bunch of recruits here, goblin recruit, human recruit. Yet they're nearly all recruits, except for a crossbow man and a spearman, which I have to assume are the leaders. The good news is I'm not seeing any beak dogs or trolls yet. That doesn't mean there aren't any, but it's a good sign. I'll take it. Now then, because our defenses are in pretty poor shape at the moment, the plan is to lock them up on the surface. We're not going to let them down into the fortress at all. That's not something we need. Certainly not. Now I did build this bridge over here so we can permanently close up this stairwell if necessary, but unfortunately it's not linked up yet, so it's not going to be of much use to us. I can however lock up these doors, and as long as they didn't bring any trolls with them, then they should hold just fine. Assuming that they do, the invaders will have to take this rampway to get down to the fortress, and that is a very, very long path. Extremely long. It's going to take them quite some time to get down to that level which is great. Now I could simply have the dwarves build a couple of walls right here so the goblins can't get into our fortress, but let's assume for a second they bring trolls with them. Those trolls can smash through those doors up top, and then the invaders will be able to get down to the old fortress level. I don't want them down here at all. It would just be easier if they couldn't get down here. And so I've ordered the dwarves to remove this constructed flooring right here, and we're going to try to build a wall up behind these doors. And once that's in place, then we'll worry about blocking up these passages. I think we're going to have enough time. I'm not too worried about it. Anyways, we're going to send all the dwarves to this temporary burrow that I just designated, which includes most of the new fortress and the stairwell, where the dwarves are going to have to be working. Let's go dwarves, no time to waste. And while the dwarves are making their way there, let's keep an eye on the siege, unpausing. Alright, they're moving in, a whole bunch of recruits here, that's a good sign. Not seeing any trolls yet, we do have a beak dog, a lot of humans, very interesting. Yeah, we have three beak dogs, a couple of armed goblins and humans, and that's it. That is the smallest siege I've seen so far. Well, I don't see any trolls here, so this door here is going to be just fine, just normally locked. So we don't have to build a wall behind it, which is fantastic. But we are going to build a wall right here now, just at the very bottom of the rampway. Just like this. And once that's complete, they will not be able to get down to the caverns at all and we'll just be able to continue on as usual underground here. I really don't want to mess around with that siege up top, even though it does not seem like a bad one at all. Yeah, let's be smart. We have to remember that about half the military has never seen combat, and I haven't even had them training yet. We've been so busy getting stuff in order in the fortress, so yeah, it would not be a smart idea to go out there and fight them. No, we'll just sit down here and focus on our traps. We'll try to get all these traps completed, and then we'll let those invaders in and try them out. Sounds like a plan to me. As long as nothing else pops up in the meantime and mucks it up, which I'm sure is going to be the case. This is Usheng Fagush after all. But yes, we are completely safe now, no worries. Nice and safe here in Usheng Bagush. Just chilling out in our meeting hall, having a drink, eating some food, enjoying the nice roaring Forgotten Beast fire. Yes, remember that a couple episodes ago I had put the corpse of Konorafathia Sithi, the fiery Forgotten Beast, over here in this little fireplace just to provide my dwarves with some nice cozy ambiance. I thought that would be nice. Might as well make some use out of the thing, right? Right. And before we get down to brass tacks, how about we take a look around the fortress a little bit more? What do you say? Actually, here's something. Right at the end of last episode, we had another dwarf create an artifact. I didn't put it in because we kind of ran out of time, and I haven't even looked at the thing yet. So let's do that. Nutug Dolek Abanushal. Negative Comet. The Constructive Treason. A Diorite Figurine. This is a diorite figurine of Zephon ceiling paints. All craft worship is of the highest quality. The item is a masterfully designed image of Zephon ceiling paints, the dwarf, and dwarves in diorite by Adil Athelushat. 
Zephon is surrounded by the dwarves. This artwork relates to the ascension of the dwarf Zephon ceiling paints to the position of Queen of the Grand Lancers in one. It is encrusted with oval diorite cabicons, oval cut green zircons, and rectangular slate cabicons. Studded with copper, decorated with cave spider silk, and encircled with bands of oval diorite cabicons. This object menaces with spikes of silver, pigtail, and spore tree. On the items an image of lens gilt the cave spider silk braise in diorite. Very interesting, very busy. It's especially neat that it's a figurine of the first queen of the Grand Lancers, seeing as how we have the current queen in our fortress. We'll have to make sure this gets a proper pedestal once we have an actual museum up and going. That'd be cool. So that's cool, another artifact. Gotta love it. And I'll tell you what, while we're still here, let's have a look around at some more notable dwarves. It's something I've been very eager to do. So, let's do it. First up, we have Aban Salabthabam, one of the fortress's rock biters. Now you may say, hey, that dwarf doesn't look very familiar, and I wouldn't blame you at all. But Aban has actually been in the fortress since day one. He is one of the starting seven dwarves, which is quite impressive if I say so myself, especially with how much carnage we've seen here in the fortress. But Aban has been one of my favorite dwarves here. He's always been around and yet you've never seen him. I imagine he's quite a modest fellow, but I suppose I may be proven otherwise. Let's take a look at his mind. Well, let's see here. He is 72 years old and is stout and incredibly muscular from all that mining, I would imagine. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. It says he personally strongly values tranquility and quiet. I don't really recall seeing a dwarf having that trait before. Kind of unique. He also lacks confidence in his abilities. He is very humble. Yep, see, I knew it. Makes perfect sense. All right, and taking a look at his gear here, all fairly standard, and he's currently wielding a copper pick. But if we have a look at it, we can see that it's actually the pick that was used to kill that giant bat back in the day by Obak the Bat Killer. Hmm. Well, it says he's modest, but apparently he's not modest enough to not steal stuff from the queen. Yeah, a fairly decent dwarf here, Aban. I get a kick out of the guy. Now back to work, you bastard. Next up, we have Moses Astral, the Baroness of Usheng Vagush. And yet another dwarf who we've had around forever. It's kind of interesting here. She uh, happens to be walking down the entry hallway here with one of her babies in one arm and a ballista bolt in the other. What a busy mommy. Now that baby is one of four of her children that currently reside in the fortress, and it's interesting that her husband's alive as well. We have an entire intact dwarven family here, something that's really great to see. Moses is 86 years old, and she carries massive amounts of fat, especially for one so short. Well, she was formerly a larder lord, so she was spending a lot of time around food. Can't really blame her, honestly. I mean, come on now. She's got four kids, I don't blame her for eating a little bit much. Oh, well, now that's interesting. It says she likes crowns, kind of like Moma's rap bite last episode, who, if you recall, was wearing five crowns. And yet Moses isn't wearing a single crown. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, and on top of that, it says she has a greedy streak. So why the hell isn't she wearing five crowns? Intriguing. Well, she doesn't seek out excitement, finds herself quite hopeful about the future. There you go. She often acts with compassion. Marvelous. And she is pleased by her own appearance and talents. You go, girl. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Moses, Baroness of the Fortress, as you were your lordship. Next up, we have Asina Napelroth, a monster slayer slash lady consort, and another very interesting figure. Now, it has been quite some time since our fortress was loaded with monster slayers. We lost a ton of them in one of those sieges, and since then, none have come to join the fortress. And in fact, we only have two left. Now, Asina has a very large family most of whom live elsewhere, but a couple of them were actually monster slayers in the fortress, who have since perished, including her mother, Ulet, and one of her cousins, Bekat. Oh boy, if we want to talk about children, look at this. She has nine children. Impressive. Sina is 47 years old, and having a look at her description here, her hair is extremely long, and she has a broad body, made broader still by no shortage of surrounding lard. Well, that's good, you're out in the caverns fighting monsters. You need that bulk. She doesn't respect a society that has settled into harmony without debate and strife. Well, that's probably why she's living here, I guess. And she's also put off by family. I suppose that's why her entire family lives outside the fortress. Certainly makes sense. That's kind of rotten. On top of that, she has a calm demeanor, as well as a tendency towards forming deep emotional bonds with others. Which I guess makes sense because she seems to have more friends than anybody else in the fortress. Yeah, a whole bunch of them. Well, Sina, honestly, I don't know how you've survived this long, but more power to you. We take our leave, Your Grace. All right, now moving on, just over here, actually, playing in this doorway, we have one of everybody's favorite dwarves in the fortress, Stinthad Arpan Melbill, Venom Blood. Yes, here he is. 
just playing by himself currently. This poor little guy. Man, I'll tell you, he has just been through the mill here. One of the very first dwarfs to be born in the fortress. He was attacked by a giant cave spider as a baby and was bitten many, many times. Hence his nickname. He did manage to survive, however, and even crawled all the way back to the fortress from the caverns. I thought he was a goner for sure. But he pulled through, but not without some permanent damage, unfortunately. In fact, his ability to stand has been lost, his ability to grasp is somewhat impaired, and he has some motor and sensory nerve damage. Not great news. Now, on top of that, both of his parents have passed away, unfortunately. Yes, they were both in the military, and his father fell fighting the goblins, while his mother was killed in a wear tapir attack quite a few years ago. And besides them, it doesn't look like he has any other friends in the fortress. Yeah, that's very sad. As sadder still is the fact that he does not really have any great clothing on currently, mostly rags, hobbling around the fortress with his crutch. Yeah, that's rotten luck, huh? He is currently six years old, only halfway to adulthood, and he is very fat. Last time I had a look, it said he was corpulent. I don't know if that means he's gained or lost weight. Hmm. Well, that's pretty interesting. It says he likes cave dragon bone. I don't know that he's ever seen this stuff, but it must just sound appealing to him. And he also likes little penguins for their way of flying through the water. That's cute. And as for his outlook, it says he values family and does not really value skills related to fighting. There go my hopes of him joining the military when he grows up. So be it. He dreams of creating a great work of art. So he might be a better craft dwarf than a warrior. It says he actively avoids exciting or stressful situations. I can relate. And yet he also lives at a high energy kinetic pace. That seems to be at odds. He enjoys being in crowds. He's often nervous. He finds himself quite hopeful about the future and tries to keep his things orderly. Oh, and I also almost forgot to mention that he is loaded with scars. Spider bites, I imagine. Poor kid. Well, there you go. Venom blood. A living story at only six years old. Keep on trucking, little dude. All right, and we'll do one more dwarf. Do some Taguzdegel, the former milker and current beast master of the fortress who's currently sitting here at this table enjoying a nice slab of reindeer meat. That's some good eating. Now, Dusum showed up in Usheng Vagush probably in the first migrant wave, and he was in fact a milker. And you may also remember that I tried out a little experiment with Dusum here, and he is what I'm calling a sponsored dwarf, kind of pseudo-controlled by my brother Joey, who ended up deciding that because Dusum is a milker and he actually really likes cows, that he would be the fortress's primary milker, and would also try to get his hands on as many cows as possible which I thought was pretty interesting. In a short time after that, the fortress's primary animal trainer ended up uh, meeting their end, and so we needed an animal trainer. And at that point, Dusum was the most qualified in the fortress, and so he took the position of Beastmaster of Usheng Bagush, on one condition, that whenever traders bring cows to the fortress, we take them, and they go to Dusum, which we've been doing, but we haven't had any more cows in the fortress recently. Man, I'll tell you, now that I'm thinking about it, Dusum is a seriously unsung hero of the fortress, I mean, not only is he the beast master, but he successfully managed to tame our first cave spider, as well as successfully rearing those cave crocodiles and their hatchlings to adulthood. Yes, he's the reason we have them now. And on top of that, do you remember when he made that artifact back a long time ago? It was a crown. But while he was doing it, he ran into our first forgotten beast that we saw here in Usheng Vagush. And in fact, he's the one who killed the creature with a boulder while in the process of making an artifact, which he then successfully completed. Yeah, wow, that really is something, huh? Anyways, let's take a closer look at the guy. Well, he's currently 82 years old, and boop boop, oh right, oh boy, that's something I, <laughs> I actually completely forgot that his lower body's fat is gone. Um, yeah, I mean, he killed that forgotten beast, the, the fiery one there, but <laughs> somehow it managed to burn away his lower body's fat, which, you know, that's not great, I don't think. <laughs> What does that mean? His lower body's fat? Ugh. I mean, I'm looking here at his health tab, and it says he has no health problems. <laughs> okay. I don't know, maybe he just has some seriously gnarly burns on his legs or something that we just never get to see because he's wearing pants. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, this is interesting down here. It says he almost never feels discouraged doesn't feel envious of others, has a calm demeanor, he avoids crowds, he is assertive, has a tendency towards forming deep emotional bonds with others, doesn't often experience strong cravings or urges, doesn't focus on material goods, he is brave in the face of imminent danger. Man, oh man, this guy is a real saint, huh? Just a great example of a dwarf. Yeah, I think I really like him more now. 
Anyways, that's gonna be enough of do some. We've gone on far too long. <laughs> I'll let you get back to your reindeer meat, buddy. Enjoy. And yeah, that's gonna be it for Notable Dwarves this episode. Although there are still quite a few others I'd like to touch on at some point. I had mentioned that Doosome is a sponsored dwarf, and we do have a few other sponsored dwarves in the fortress now. I had done a random drawing on my Patreon page, and each one of these dwarves with asterisks around their profession name is a sponsored dwarf. Like our new bookkeeper, the old probably crazy alchemist, Rakust the grumpy anvil beater. Yeah, there's quite a few in there but they're gonna have to work pretty hard to work their way up. We have no reason to care about them yet, but I'm sure they'll grow on us in time. No worries. But yeah, we have to get back to work. If we have a look over at our ballista bank here, it is completely good to go. Our two ballistas are both loaded up, and you can see we even have a trap maker set up at this one, ready to fire. And I'll tell you what, how about we do just that? If we look over here, this bridge is up, so there is no danger of that bolt slamming down the corridor and killing my dwarves. Very important. So, yeah, let's do it. I will set this ballista to fire at will, and let's see what happens. There it goes. Well, that was pretty cool, although it went off to the side and crashed into the wall. Lame. Yeah, it looks like we definitely should get some more practice with our trap makers. So for now, I'm just going to set both these ballistas to fire at will. Because shafts like that are not going to cut it. Not at all. Oh, here we go. That was a pretty direct hit. Not bad at all, actually. Good shot. And here comes another. There it goes. Ooh, very good. And another. There it goes. Fairly straight, but not so bad. And we can see underneath the ballista bolts do fall down here, completely unscathed, and ready to be hauled back up to the ballista chamber by our dwarves. Perfect. Yeah, so this is good. I'm just going to keep having my dwarves fire these ballistas constantly, because it's not going to hurt anything really. We have plenty of trap makers, so it's going to be good to get a bunch of them to have some skill with the things. And as for our pit trap over here, we do have three retracting bridges in place now, so the entry hallway is back in business, but before we do anything with it, I realized that the walls of this pit are still rough stone, which is very easy for goblins to climb, so we're going to want to smooth that up a bit, which is going to be kind of a pain in the ass, but I mean, you got to do what you got to do, right? It's for the best. And while the dwarves get that taken care of, we still have to make sure all these bridges are linked up to the pressure plates at the end of the hallway, and I have to imagine it's going to take a bit of doing, but no worries. We're in no huge rush here. Yeah, we have a lot of tedious stuff going on in the fortress. For example, we have to toss out all these useless ballista parts, and on top of that, we're getting the fifth level of the residential hall completed as we speak. Yeah, it's getting there. We haven't looked at it in a couple episodes, but it is now halfway complete, which is not too shabby. Hey, very good. It looks like the bottom of our crocodile pit is all set to go now. Nice and smooth. Hopefully that'll help with goblins trying to climb out. Now the next thing we gotta do is clear out all this stone here, and then we can start filling it with water. Very exciting. Yeah, man, I'll tell ya, we have a ton to do in the fortress. On top of getting all these traps in place, I'm really trying to get these items here in order. There's still so many of them. So if we have a look over here at our farm area, I've carved out a large cavern over on the right side, and I'm gonna put our kitchens and stills in there, as well as a bunch of our unrefined foods. Thought I'd get some of that stuff out of the way. And on top of that, we're still pecking away at our residential area. We have a lot of furniture to get in place. That'll really help getting our entry hall clear. But damn, I guess we still have a long way to go. Oh, here's something interesting. A goblin diplomat from Iquianthath has arrived. Now, Iquianthath is the human civilization, not the goblins. But this might be trouble regardless. Because remember, those invading goblins are still up on the surface. It is not going to look good for us if the humans lose a diplomat here. Huh, <sighs> what to do, what to do? Well, let's just, uh, let's watch him. See what happens. Alright, at the time being, it seems like he's fairly content just sitting at the edge of the map. Okay, well, that's good. Just stay there, okay? I really don't want this guy to get killed. Oh, you know, actually having a look up on the surface, I realize that the siege is over. There's just one small group of goblins and humans over here beating on this uh, giant one-humped camel. But that's it. Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what, you guys can uh, keep at it, and we'll just keep working on the traps for now. It's a shame we're not going to have anybody to try them out on, but hey, whatever. Not a biggie. But I'll tell you what, something we can do is unlock this door right here, just so that diplomat can get down to safety. And here they come, very good. Just this way, sir. Followed by a couple of human guards, actually. That's pretty neat. Gotta take down this wall right here, and then we'll be back in business. Very good. You know, it's pretty embarrassing that our queen doesn't have an office yet, let alone a proper throne room. But, eh, we're busy dwarves. We have a lot of stuff to take care of here. Plus, it might be kind of nice to meet by this roaring fire over here, wouldn't you say? Greetings, noble dwarf. There is much to discuss. It's such a pleasant place you've carved out for yourselves. 
there is much to share. Information added to the civilizations slash world info. Very interesting. It has been an honor, noble Obak the Bat Killer, Sodalum. I bid you farewell. Very cool. Tell you what, you may be a goblin, but you make a damn fine diplomat for those humans. I gotta say, and very pleasant. Now let's see here. He has a whole bunch of information here. Mostly a leadership exchange. Nothing too thrilling. But up to our north, it looks like this human village known as Most Smiled was conquered by the Frosty Barbarity. And a whole bunch of refugee groups have departed from it. And over here, it looks like Kindness Girder, another human village, was conquered by the goblins as well. And then farther up north, it looks like the goblins have been causing trouble as well. Bunch of bastards. Well, they'll get theirs eventually, I'm sure. Not really willing to take too much more goblin crap here in Ushangbagush. And once we're well protected here in our fortress, I'd really like a chance to send out squads and do some damage to those goblins. They certainly deserve it. Alright, well these traps are certainly taking forever to get completed. Now if we have a look over here at our crocodile trap, you can see along both sides I've set up a row of pressure plates, as well as a row of menacing silver spikes. Now one of my fears with this trap is that when the bridge opens, a goblin with a ranged weapon like a crossbow could just kind of sit up there and shoot down at the crocodiles. And I'd really like for that to not happen. And now, I don't know if this is going to help, but each one of these pressure plates is going to be attached to each one of these upright spikes. So that if a goblin is standing at the edge, and somebody triggers this trap, then the spikes will ram up into them, and hopefully they'll fall down, or at least move out of the way. <laughs> I don't know how well it's going to work, but eh, what the hell. On top of that, any enemies coming down this corridor are likely to trigger this trap, and get skewered on these spikes. Which is just plain old fun right there. Still trying to get these boulders out of here. That's taking a hell of a long time, I'll tell you what. And also over here in this corner, you can see I made a little hole. And if we look down, it leads to this tunnel here, and then over this way. I figured I'd make a little bit of a drainage canal, just so that if that pit gets filled up with goblin armor and weapons over time, we have a way to clean it out. Probably for the best, right? Oh, looks like we have another forgotten beast here. The forgotten beast, Ankasum Anaus Mat, has come. A great three-eyed sauropod. It has large mandibles and it has a bloated body. Its dark olive scales are blocky and close set. Beware its deadly blood. Deadly blood. That could be a potentially bad one. Hmm. Well, let's see, where is it? Alright, well currently it looks like the creature's on the same level as the new fortress, but it's kind of in a weird location. Hmm, you know? It looks like there's only one narrow path out of where it currently is, and that path might be blocked up by trees. Very interesting. Alright, well, before we take any action with Burrows, let's see what this creature does. Unpausing. Alright, seems to be booking in. Oh, turned around. Going up that narrow ramp I was talking about. And back down. Back up. Seems a little confused. You know, I'm having a feeling that this one's stuck here as well. Very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, it just keeps going up and down, up and down. It really doesn't seem to be able to get out of here. Fantastic. Perhaps we have another candidate for our Forgotten Beast pens, huh? Except this time I'm not going to be putting doors up. <laughs> for obvious reasons. You know what? That actually sounds like a pretty neat idea. What the hell? Let's go for it. We still have some time left in this episode, and I'm dying for something interesting to happen. First things first, we're going to have to clean up this area just a little bit, get rid of all these workshops. They'll be destroyed by a Forgotten Beast anyways. And another interesting thing, our tamed cave crocodiles actually laid some more eggs that we let hatch, so now we have a whole bunch of cave crocodile hatchlings all over the fortress. And I dug out a little room here next to our farm area down in the caverns, and I'm just having them all brought into this chamber, just to make sure they're out of harm's way. And yes, I know this room's kind of crappy looking at the moment, but we're going to nice it up in the future, don't worry about it. Having one more look at our forgotten beast pens, they appear to be good to go, and I'm fairly confident they are. No worries. And down here in our lever chamber, I'm going to pull this lever here to open that bridge that's currently containing the weevil. There we go. Bridge is open. And I'll tell you what, one last thing I'm going to do is order these doors to be destroyed, all except that last one. I imagine that will be safe. Certainly hoping so. Alright, well, that, that's interesting. I don't know if you saw that, but the civilians ran away after trying to destroy these doors, saying they were interrupted by a forgotten beast. And going over this one door that's currently containing the Weevil, it says that it is passable and open. Although it doesn't appear to be open, and the Weevil certainly isn't moving through it yet. Hmm, getting a little nervous, I don't know what the hell that means. It still hasn't gotten the door down yet though. Well anyways, after we get all those doors out of there, I want to try to hook up a lever to that last door. And maybe I can use the lever to open that door? It's going to be our safest option, but I'm not sure if it's going to work. Alright, we got that lever in place, and I just ordered it to be linked up. Oh, yeah, it looks like a trap maker was interrupted by this forgotten beast. Oy. Yeah, that lever idea is not going to work. 
Well, I suppose I could try to chop down these trees over here, but I have the distinct feeling that this forgotten beast is going to continue trying to destroy this door, even when the path is clear. Now, my hope is that somebody can cut down these trees and then just run back to the fortress as fast as they can. All right, there's one tree, and now the next. And as soon as that tree comes down, I'm having the dwarves get back into the fortress nice and safe. All right, here they come. Chopping, and... Tree is down, and it looks like the weevil has no interest in moving at all. Fantastic. <sighs> okay, well, running out of options. In fact, I wonder if we can wall it back up in there. Yeah, very confused about this whole thing here. All right, well, the last and most foolish thing we could try to do with this creature is to mine away the cave wall right next to it. I don't know if that's going to work. I'd have to imagine it will. First, we'll have some dwarves clear these trees away just to open it up a bit. Oh, whoa, 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 I just, uh, I, I paused it here. It looks like the weevil has taken a step through the door. Oh, oh, okay, um, it is moving. It is through the door. I don't know what triggered this. Okay, um, panic mode. All dwarves to the meeting hall and residence level now. Go ahead, dwarves, get there. And the weevil appears to be stopped. Oh, oh, no, it's continuing. Okay, yeah, it's on its way. All right, come on, you dwarves, keep running. There's a giant ulm in this hallway here. Hopefully it slows the weevil down a little bit. Uh, yep, the weevil is fighting and killed it pretty easily. Over here, looking at the pens, we have a bunch of warrior dwarves passing by one of the pens as we speak. That's not fantastic news. If they spot that forgotten beast, they're going to rush out and try to kill the thing. Yeah, and the beast is still moving, coming towards the fortress. Oh, and damn it, some of these warriors are heading out this door. I forgot to close up a back entrance up to the meeting hall. Super annoying. I don't know, I'm just over here watching now. I'm not sure what's going to happen. That weevil's kind of moving in, heading up towards the pen here. And it looks like it's about to step in. I have the game paused. And I'm just going to try to close up the pen right now. All right, unpausing. All right, the creature is in. Moving straight into the entry hall. It has not been stopped by those statues at all. all right, but it, is, it seems to be stopped here in the entry hallway at the moment. All right, so basically what we have here is a typical Usheng Vagush cluster. This might get ugly, and I'm not too happy about it, to be perfectly honest. Well... I'm not too sure what to do. <laughs> right, oh, 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 the beast is moving back down towards the Forgotten Beast Pen. It's in. Oh my god, and the gates are closed. It's attacking a war dog, though. But, oh, holy hell, that's besides the point. Wow, that was lucky. Holy hell. And now the beast is just running around, smashing down statues. That was so lucky, everyone. What the hell? All right, turning the burrow off, and I guess we now have a captured Forgotten Beast. Ooh, that is so awesome. Well, I guess not all my plans are awful, huh? Especially when they get super, super lucky. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, I'd say it's a pretty damn fine note to leave off on, huh? A captured forgotten beast. Yeah, I'm pretty happy about that. And the fortress's defenses grow stronger. Defenses which now include a near-functioning crocodile pit, along with menacing silver spike traps, and the hopefully devastating ballista hallway. Yeah, man, that's gonna be some good stuff, I'm telling you. Those goblins are in for one heck of a surprise, assuming all our traps work out correctly. <laughs> Which, you know, I guess I'm not counting on. <laughs> uh, well, anyways, you guys, next episode we'll finish off our crocodile pit, and we'll make sure our entry hallway is polished to a nice sheen. Can't have it looking too shabby for those goblins, huh? And on top of that, I'll show off a couple extra little tiny things I've done in the fortress, and we'll also start making this place a bit more livable, instead of the janky hellhole that it currently is, you know. And then once we're all nice and settled in, we can start thinking about sending out some visitors to those goblins. See how they like it. Yeah, that'll be cool as hell, huh? Anywho, I'll tell you what, can you listen to me, you bearded bastards? Just for a second. I truly hope you enjoyed this episode. Like, actually. There is really nothing I love more than entertaining you guys. Every single one of you is just great. And I truly mean that. Thank you for joining me, and I certainly hope you'll join me next time here in Usheng Bagush. Monster Killer. And until then, you bearded bastards.